Thank you, Victoria. Good evening. So uh, there's limited cure for neurologic disease. And uh, part of this comes from the fact that uh, we really need models to understand what really goes wrong in neurologic disease. So basically, for many, many years, the mouse has been the most studied model trying to understand what's going wrong. But as you can see here also, there's major differences in size, but also in the structure of, for example, the brain of a mouse. Then the next step to get closer to humans would be to go for neuropathology. And as you can see here, this is an Alzheimer's disease brain. Uh, there's a clear difference. But this is the end stage of the disease. And to really find cures, you need to understand the temporal resolution of the disease. And since we are having troubles in asking a patient to give us a part of his brain, we need to think about other cellular models. And one of them I will go to present today. So the solution is don't take the brain, take something else. And uh, the options uh, are, are broad, but, but for example, blood or skin is much easier to reach than the brain, obviously. And the solution is to turn those cells into cells of the brain, for example, uh, neurons shown here, and then to study the patient's disease in the dish by uh, looking at exactly the cel same cells that are affected. So let's take a look a closer look and zoom in here. So the major revolution was to learn how to turn any cell of the body, for example the skin cell here, into a neuron. And the strategy for this is to do a gene switch, to turn the skin cell into a cell that's pluripotent. So basically to turn it back to an embryonic-like state so that uh, this cell can become anything when it's grown up. And uh, as, as neuroscientists, we are specifically interested in those cells that make the brain. So we differentiate those cells via different steps, and in the end, we get a neuron. And this is not my invention, but it's invention of Shinya Yamanaka, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for this in 2012. So I decided to get you f to have a look through the microscope. And, and this is kind of the uh, way from going here, from pluripotent stem cells to neurons. So the first step here, the uh, pluripotent stem cells. So they are clumped together, very roundish cells. And then we start to instruct them to do things that they would kind of do during embryonic development. So first we ask them to free float and form balls, and then we ask them to settle down to give them a chance that the neurons can start growing out of this ball. And once we have those uh, progenitor cells for neurons, we then ask them to differentiate into fully mature neurons. So this seems easy, but it's a process that takes six weeks or longer, and a lot of my PhD students' time at the moment. And, uh, and this is how it looks at the end. Those beautiful green cells, those are all uh, neurons, and those were also the first neurons that we created in Erlangen at the time that were from a human patient. And uh, one of the most important things about neurons is that they are able to communicate with each other. And neuronal communication is not chatting, but it's to be electrically active to transmit the signals. And uh, this is what we are going to use. And uh, within the next couple of minutes, I'm going to show to you how we can apply those techniques to biomedical questions. And the two major research fields that uh, my lab is following up is to study disease mechanisms in specific diseases, but also to look at compound testing and define drugs that potentially might turn into uh, medication. Theoretically, 
you can also transplant those cells back into the brain, but it's a technique that, in my expectation, will not become a valuable technique in Germany due to uh, restrictions on the ethical and legal side. And the two stories that I'm going to show within the next minutes is, is diseases that we are trying to understand by using this model. So one is uh, chronic pain and the other one is Parkinson's disease. So let's start with the pain. So this proof case is a patient uh, with a chronic pain called small fiber neuropathy. So to get you an imagination of what this all is about is that she has been in severe pain for more than 10 years. And she has tried all the drugs that are usually given to treat pain and none of them worked. And when you ask her for the severeness of the pain, which is usually done on a scale from, one to, uh, from zero to 10, and zero is no pain, and 10 is maximal pain, and then with 7.5, she's pretty, pretty at the top of, of what somebody can bear over a time. And we also have some uh, neurophysiology on the patient, which is a technique called uh, microneography, which my colleague Barbara Nama was performing on that patient. And what she saw was that it's not only the pain in the patient, but there's one measurement that kind of reflects this pain, and it's this hyperactivity of very small nerves. And so we went on to uh, get a sample from the patient and uh, to turn this into pluripotent stem cells and then turn it into peripheral neurons. <coughs> and since uh, activities seem to be so important in the patient, we also looked at activity first. And uh, so we put the cells on a multi-electrode plate with electrodes measuring the activity and uh, here you can see the controls and activity would show up as one of those bluish and then yellow dots, which you rarely see in the controls. But if you look at all the patient cells, which are around here, then you realize that there are many more of those blue bright dots popping up over time. So we started to measure this and this is what we found. So in healthy uh, neurons, we see rarely any activity. But in the patient, this activity, as shown here again in those uh, blue, yellowish dots, is significantly higher. And the next step was to think about uh, compounds and potential ways of trying to reduce this hyperactivity back to a normal stage. So we tried several compounds, and I'm not showing this whole uh, testing right now. I just show you one drug because I think that was really important. So that drug that I'm going to show is called lecosamide, and it's a drug that's usually used to treat epilepsy. And when we put on lecosamide, something very unexpected happened. So we were able to turn this hyperactivity from in, in the cells from the patient back to normal levels here, here in green. So we were kind of really lucky since lecosamide is a, is a drug that's, that's approved by, uh, by the FDA, so, so people use it for other implications. So we recommend it to the clinician of the patient uh, to recommend it to the patient. And so she took the medication and this is the untreated situation as seen before. And this was really surprising. So uh, our prediction of what we saw in the electrophysiology on the cells totally correlated with what we saw when she took it. She said the pain is just gone. And then for some other medical conditions, she had to interrupt this uh, treatment and the pain came back, which was not cool for her, but a proof that the the compound worked, and when she restarted again, uh, it was back. And uh, Barbara Nama, my colleague, did microneurography on the patient again, and what she could see is that this hyperactivity and the lacosamide normalized. So basically, we found a way here to take information uh, from, from the patient, patient cells, 
and get those findings back to the patient. So that was the pain. But the next that I'm going to step into is a chronic and new degenerative disease. It's called Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease, motor symptoms mostly consist of uh, shaking, of slow movements, and of stiffness of the mus muscles. And right now, there is symptomatic treatment, but there is no way to really halt the progression of the disease. So this is what we see neuropathologically. There's this death of dopaminergic neurons in, in the midbrain, so an area located around here. And since those dopaminergic neurons die, there's uh, less dopamine transmitted to the basal ganglia, and that's what causes uh, those symptoms. And still, there are major differences between different patients. So some are very stable and some progress very fast. And uh, one of those uh, causes to for, for this disease modulation is the immune system. And so there is a hypothesis out there that uh, not only the immune system of the brain, the microglia, but also peripheral immune cells are able to infiltrate into the brain during Parkinson's disease and then uh, contact the neuron. So uh, we thought about a technique to stimulate this, this interaction in the dish. And uh, this is the work by a PhD student in my lab, Annika Sommer and Irina Protz. And basically, they went the classical way to go for the neuron. And then they took blood from the patient and with the help of Jürgen Winkler and Frank Smarkswriter in the outpatient clinic for movement disorders and then isolated immune cells from this blood sample and activated them and then created a co-culture of neurons and peripheral immune cells. So what about Parkinson's disease? If you take cells from Parkinson's disease patients and controls, what you see is that in PD, those neurons disappear. So the neurons die when they interact uh, with immune cells. And are we able to rescue this? And surprisingly enough, we found uh, an antibody-based uh, therapy where we were able to uh, block the immune cells and then the neurons would survive even in the Parkinson disease patients. And this is really important since uh, this could define new therapies since one of the compounds that we tried here is a drug called secuginimab, which is used already in the clinic for, the, for psoriasis treatment and could be repurposed. So those are ways to look at neurons in the dish and, inter and, and see what happens in disease modeling or compound testing on the neurons. But as already uh, mentioned, there are many more cells uh, in the brain that, that need to be taken into account for this. So there are astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, there's the immune cell of the brain, but also parasites. And this uh, led to the creation of a Bavarian consortium for human stem cells uh, called For Inter. And as you can see, the collaborators are located all over Bavaria. And uh, there is uh, groups in Erlangen who are mostly focusing on uh, cell-based assays. There is uh, neuropathology involved. There is a larger group of bioinformaticians and computational scientists and mathematicians involved. But as human stem cells uh, are also of, uh, of impact for, for ethics and the law, we also uh, got lawyers into our consortium. And I'm happy to tell you that uh, tonight's speakers are from different locations and from different aspects of this consortium and uh, will present their perspective on human stem cells. So to sum up here, uh, I hope I could show you that human stem cells are a very important model for studying neurologic diseases. 
and that those systems allow us to test uh, for a specific compounds and potential medication for neurologic diseases, as shown, for example, for pain or Parkinson's disease. But I think what's more important is that those are all very complex experiments that need, uh, that need clinicians, that need uh, people in molecular and cellular biology, that uh, need a lot of computational biology, but also need to cover the ethical aspect and uh, consortial efforts are necessary for this. So thank you for your attention. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Beate. Let's see if we have some questions. So we have two volunteers with microphones, and there is one question in the middle. Uh, Adela, in the middle. Uh, please wait until uh, Adela comes to you with a microphone. Um, thank you. So I'm not sure I understood if the fact that neurons are killed by immune uh, system cells uh, in the Parkinson's disease is, a, is the cause of the Parkinson's disease or a consequence, or you just don't know yet? Uh, so I would say it's, some, it's an important modifier. So, so we are trying to find out whether or not it's a cause by taking a larger group into account. But at the moment, I think we are sure enough to say it's an important modifier of the disease. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there are more. Yes, there is also one more in the middle. Adela, a bit from front. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the inter interesting lecture. I had um, have, uh, I have a question because you mentioned that there were some ethical and legal concerns raised towards like the subject of your research. Could you elaborate on that? Like, what what what's the problem that people would be so having? So I'm with I'm not sure if I'm the expert <laughs> to elaborate <laughs> since there will be a talk ah, on 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 those aspects, but. For our part, uh, of course, the most obvious part is we are working with material from patients that gave their cells to us to study. Uh, but there are many more things that will be raised, I think, after the break, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK. More biological side questions here. <laughs> Let's wait with the legal ones for later, for Hannes. Um, not right now. OK. Uh, well. Yes, there is one more in the middle as well. Yes. Um. Um, hello. Thank you very much for the lecture. I have a question. There was one slide where you showed that you turn the skin cells into the neurons. And then in your words, you said we first ask them to be like a ball or something. And then we ask them, could you elaborate how do you ask? Like, how does it work <laughs> in the lab? <laughs> I'm, I'm completely not from biology field. Yeah. And come so from so the question was uh, how exactly we perform the technique to turn the skin cell into a stem cell and into a neuron. And basically, this first step is, is done by jump-starting uh, genes that are on during embryonic development. So that can be done, for example, by adding a virus, but that can also be done by adding proteins. So, so there are various ways, but the important thing is to tell the pluripotency genes, so to do this gene switch and turn them on again. And then the cell can be anything it, it wants to be. And then uh, for the second step, to go from the pluripotent cell to the neuron, it's basically changing the environment and making the cell feel that this feels like inner brain and adding, <laughs> adding kind of growth factors that that cell would also meet when it uh, gets or when it's growing in the brain. Thank you, Beate. So I encourage you all to come to Beate in the break, ask more questions, and now let's thank her.